All right. Um, so Google's back on stage with uh, subject on big data again. Um, for the ones in the room that uh, followed my colleague earlier on, um, you probably have seen a few of the big query. Um, well, BigQuery queries <laughs> again already. My name is Dirk Prince. I'm working for Google in the developer relations department, and I'm responsible for the whole German-speaking region. And uh, well, um, cloud subjects are one of my favorites because you you get such a massive scale uh, at, at points. And for the next 20 minutes, what I like to to do with you is I like to have a look at BigQuery. Um, from the point of view for how do we actually accomplish uh, queries that go over massive scales of data like gigabytes of data, terabytes of data, without having to well wait minutes and, uh, and, and um, go grab a coffee or such, um, but instead get uh, really almost real-time responses like in the 5 to 20 seconds range, as you have seen in, in examples earlier. So, um, if you're interested in that type of thing, then you probably have browsed the Google for Developers websites already. Might have uh, browsed for the cloud technology, and you find something there that's called the Dremel white paper. So, Dremel is the code name, or the former code name of BigQuery, and it explains in quite uh, computer scientific terms how we actually do what we do in BigQuery. Um, now, uh, when I prepared for that session, I downloaded that paper and I had a good long look at that paper. And uh, I tell you, that's kind of a little bit painful. Um, go through the experience yourself. But the whole point of this session is actually uh, to walk you through the, uh, through the algorithm in a way that's not that painful and interesting. And, uh, well, um, it's hopefully interesting and not that painful. That was uh, proper English, I guess. And uh, well, so you get an unfair advantage above me and uh, others who have uh, prepared for that session. So you you have a general understanding already. All right. Um, so, BigQuery. What is it? For those of you who haven't been here uh, on the session before, um, how many of you in the audience um, have played with BigQuery? already? Like five or six people? Who knows what BigQuery is? In essence. Yeah, those were the ones who were in the session earlier, I guess, and a few of those who played with it. Um, all right, so um, you find BigQuery on, um, well, or the interface to BigQuery. Um, if you go to developers.google.com, you just follow the signs, so to speak, uh, the links to the BigQuery dashboard. And it basically, think of it as a read-only database in the cloud that you can use to analyze your data to, to fire queries against to work with it. And what you, what you find is, as an interface, and BigQuery, of course, has an API that you can use as a developer as well. But if you go to the developer console, you, you find um, basically this type of interface. You can type in a query, you can select your data, um, you can um, well upload your, um, your data that you want to analyze and such. And the type of data set that we like to use for the next uh, 20 minutes will be uh, the GitHub archive. So GitHub basically um, publishes the whole, the whole set of commits as a big database, and we have it as a public data set in BigQuery for you to play as well. And it's a pretty useful data set if you like to play a little bit, uh, bit with it. So for the starter, um, to get a feel for the type of technology we talk about, um, I prepared a statement, a query, that um, basically counts all the languages or the commit in um, um, in GitHub, uh, according to the languages that uh, they are using. And um, what you see here is um, kind of like runs through the data. That's processed like, uh, well, 1.14 gigabytes of data in about three seconds. So it's not too bad. You can also enable caching. I disabled it for the, for the, for the demo to, to get a real, real timing here. And what we see is uh, the query results at the top, uh, at the bottom, which Basically, it's no surprise. It's, uh, well, it, it basically says uh, JavaScript is the most common language in GitHub repository, followed by Java, followed by Ruby, followed by Python, followed by PHP, and, uh, well, I guess followed by all the other stuff down there. So we can 
loop through 180 pages, I spare you the, the pain right now. Um, but of course, we can download it as a CSV, as you seen, uh, might have seen earlier, and we can continue to work with that type of data. So to give you an idea about what's possible with it, um, I prepared a few other statements. I thought that we'd do a little scientific experiment here and have a look at um, how you guys behave when you submit code to the GitHub repository. So I um, assembled a list of quite colorful language. Yeah, read it carefully. You never used one of those in your comments, right? Um, and, well, make a, make a run through the GitHub repository and look for um, the overall uh, setup in the commitments. And again, it takes a few seconds. So we processed about six gigabytes of data right now. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, goddamn game developers. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, any Vimal developers in the room? I've seen one hand, <laughs> one hand. I didn't even know that it uh, exists, but, uh, but uh, when I think of VI, I'm, yeah, I can understand why you're in the mood of colorful language then. Um, C sharp, C, somewhere in the middle, and uh, again, there are, there are more, more data sets to discover if you, if you page through that. Um, well, looking at the swearing in GitHub, maybe, maybe we should uh, have something to balance that and look for the most polite uh, developer as well. And the most polite developer, of course, would be someone who says, thank you for uh, well, checking your data before submitting it to my function, and please be respectfully when you add uh, um, something to my data by, uh, database, and so on and so forth. And we do the same exercise, again. And who would have thought that the C developers are the most polite developers in the GitHub repository? So, uh, well, that's data. Data never lies, as we all know. So this is a scientific fact now. And next time you meet a C developer in your team, think of it. When you are start swearing, he might just say thank you, respectfully. <laughs> Yeah, so the whole point of that exercise is to give you an idea about the, the stunning speed the whole um, BigQuery engine on, um, is working behind the scenes. So um, that's not the only public data set. You can play with a number of public data sets or uh, your own data as well. Um, so have a look. You can browse through all the Shakespeare works or through Wikipedia, as you, um, as you might have seen earlier. And those are very interesting data sets to work with. And the question raises how we are pulling that off, um, getting um, this type of um, speed. And well, now it would be great if I get a internet connection here. Because I would like to continue explaining the algorithm. Well, anyway, I think it uh, might, might work that way uh, as well. So for the for the next 50 minutes or so, I walk you through how the whole thing works. And I were, um, basically, you see, um, there are two, two types of data that we can actually attempt to analyze, uh, especially in the web world. One is uh, the, the realm of the rational database. So uh, you have tables, you have columns, you have rows in there, and it's a very straightforward uh, but struct, uh, strict and structured type of approach, um, how, you, how you work with your data. The other way of data, um, the other kind of data that you often see is uh, the type of data you s might see in in JSON objects or in XML or in that example here. And I try to get you that that noise out of that. Oh. Should stop uh, breathing when I talk with that microphone. Um, yeah, that the type of um, type of information that you find in JSON data sets or in XML, which is basically a hierarchical kind of uh, data representation, where you where you have not a fixed structure um, up front, but more more or less you you add nodes as you come along to your to your data items. Both types of data can be found in. Uh, in BigQuery, but the more interesting ones are certainly um, those hierarchical type of data sets. Because if you think about it, um, if we if we try to solve the task to analyze the web, that which is kind of what Google does on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and 
firing searches on the whole public internet. What you find there is HTML and XML, which is that kind of hierarchical representation of data that you need to analyze. So for the, for the example, we walk, uh, I walk you through um, a list of books. For simplicity, it's a very simple list of books, but um, you, you kind of walk out here with the idea of the algorithm and you can go as complex as you like to be. And um, those three books uh, in my example have a number of different items and uh, elements on it, like um, author, title, pricing, and so on and so forth. And this is the kind of uh, query that we like to analyze here. So when you think about BigQuery or when you think about database in general, what you try to avoid is usually a full table scan, right? So you try to be efficient in your query. And no normally databases build indices and try to optimize your speed of, um, of um, selecting data by, um, well, by selecting specifically what feels to touch. But in case of BigQuery, what you, what you essentially try to do is you do a full table scan. You analyze all there is in the data set. So, if you use BigQuery, then you say the battle is lost, I need a full table scan, and BigQuery is the way to make the most efficient full table scan that you can, can use today. And that's the type of query that we walk through in the next few slides. Okay, remember the books that I, that I mentioned? And um, so, I think I have, yeah, I have a connection again. So we can make that a little bit larger. So there are three books with authors and titles attached to it, and um, the very first trick uh, Big, Big Query is, uh, is doing is uh, it changes the representation of that data from a row-based representation to a column-based representation. So instead of um, having all those rows with all the data in it, it changes the way it stores the data efficiently to columns. So you have an author column, a title column, a price column, um, price.euro, price.usd, and so on and so forth. And um, if you look at the, the elements here, those are the data stored within. And uh, just ignore the, the, the numbers in the parentheses right now. Those are the magic sauce that make BigQuery work. We, we go through it in a bit. Um, but essentially, that's the very first trick, um, changing the representation of the data. All right. And by... Thinking of the data, the next, uh, the next uh, step BigQuery is taking is um, it analyzes the data set and it adds, uh, metaphorical speaking, the missing elements to the other, the other row, so to speak. So um, if you look at book two, we see we have authors, we have a title, but there is no price. But there is a price in book one and there is a price in book three, so it adds the price and the responsible um, subnotes to the, the representation. I write it in, in parentheses to make it, make it clear that they are actually not data, not data in the BigQuery representation, but it's an added element to the whole thing. It's stored very efficiently, so it doesn't add up to the data, but at least conceptually, for walking through the data, they need to be there, so they, BigQuery adds those elements. Then, in the next step, um, it gives names to all elements. And those names are uh, following a typical pattern that you might recognize as a developer. So if you, lo if you look at author, well, it's pretty straightforward. Author title are named quite uh, directly. Then we have the price.discount property, the price.usd property, price.euro, and so on and so forth. In cases where we have more uh, than one element, like here with authors or down there with prices, it's like an array representation. So you, you simply count through the elements. And again, um, for completionists, um, here are the, the names in parentheses for the, for the elements that actually don't carry any value. All right, now let's have a look at those numbers. And Stay with me, because we walk through it in a bit, and then it makes all sense when it comes together. There are the two numbers with each data element, and one is uh, called the repetition counter, or repeat count, and um, which is basically uh, the number 
of elements following, um, or the, the number of repetition a, a data element has. So if you look through that, if you have a, re a repeat count of, of zero at the title element, this means this is the first occurrence of title, and um, the same is true for, for um, price.discount, price.usd, price euro. Those are all repeat count zero because they are the first instance in that data set. Um, going to book two, it's pretty similar. Author is the first um, occurrence, so it's a repeat count of zero. Um, but it's repeated. It's repeated once here and it's repeated once there. So it's a repetition of that element. So it's a repeat count one in both cases. And if you go all the way down, you find the same pattern like here with the prices. So the, the price, um, price element is, um, is counted here as a repetition. The second number is the, is the um, um, uh, definition number. So, what it basically says, how many um, of those elements are, are defined? So, if we look here, um, price.discounts are two elements. So, it's a price element and a discount element. And if it carries a value, then price is defined and discount is defined. So, the the definition count is two. Same here, same here. If we go down here, then we have an author element, which is just uh, one element and it is defined. So it, definition count is one. Go, let's go down here. Here we have an interesting one, which is a definition count of two for price.discount, um, followed by a definition count of one, price.usd. This is because the price tag actually is there in that element, but USD is not defined, so it's just one defined element and not the second one. I hope I, you're still with me. Little, those of you who are short now, yeah, some nodding. That's good. <laughs> all right. So let's bring it all together because it's quite theoretical right now and um, we, we play it through with one... Um, in the first example with one column and then we use two columns because remember we are actually trying to do a select star from all books where prices in, in euro and, uh, and USD are in a certain amount. That was the query that I showed you earlier. And um, we are doing that right now by, um, with the author's column. So um, the author of the first book, what we see here is... Um, we see a repeat count of zero, so it's a new book. And we see a, a, a definition count of one, so yes, the author is defined. The value is Dumas. We have a book one, author Dumas. Um, next book. Um, because we have a, a um, repetition count of zero, it's a new book. And we have a definition count of one, so it's defined. And we have an author. And now the author gets repeated. That's because the repetition, um, we see that in the repetition count, which is one now. And it's also defined. And this, of course, is the same case in the next author element. Then we have a null. And this is an undefined author element. And we see it's a new book. We see it's not copied. So it's essentially a new book, which happens to have no author attached to it. All right, St are you still with me? Or anyone in the room that likes me to go over that one more time? No. Everyone in the room, no, please. <laughs> um, okay, so now let's, yeah? Yeah? I'm, can you say it again? Um, the question was, the, the repetition count, can it be higher than one? Or can it just uh, true or false? Yeah, it's true or false. Okay. All right. Um, so let's do it with the euro price tag and the US dollar price tag, because that was what, what the query was selecting for. And that's where the whole magic basically happens and it gets more interesting. Uh, or at least my definition of interesting here. Um, so, first... First uh, item, 
we see it's a repetition count of zero, so it's a new book. And it's a definition count of two. So price is defined and euro is defined. We have a euro price. And here's the same, zero because it's a new book, and two because price is defined and USD is defined. The next element, um, we see it's a new book because um, repetition count is zero and definition count zero means there is no euro price element to it. And it's the same case down here, so we don't have a price tag attached to book two. Um, next, because it's zero, we know it's a new book. Here, the definition count is two. Price and euro are defined, so we have an item. Here, the definition count is one, because price is defined. We do have a price, but it happens to be not a US dollar price, but a euro price. And um, this is a pretty similar case. So uh, here we have, uh, we know, we, or uh, not a similar case, it's a similar case than before. We have a repetition. So this element happens to have a, another price in, in euro. And again, price and euro tag are defined, so it's two. And we know it's a euro price. And down here we have a null element, which uh, basically means the value for USD is zero, or is, is not defined. And, but we know it's a repetition, and we know that price is defined, but USD is not defined. So it's one, one, one. All right, why are we doing all that? Um, Essentially, what we are doing with that type of algorithm is we optimize what columns we need to touch in order to do the full table scan. Instead of, of uh, running through the whole data set of uh, I don't know how many gigabyte or terabyte of data, you're essentially just touching those elements that are used in the query. And um, those two counters and uh, the way you walk through the data enables you to do that very efficiently without losing the overall structure of the data. So you get, as a, as a uh, uh, reply, you get the real data set that you ask for. And instead of browsing through, let's say, five gigabytes of data, you're parsing just a few hundred megabytes. Nevertheless, um, those few hundred megabytes need to be still um, crawled and uh, um, um, run through very efficiently. And of course, we do that with the power of the Google data centers. So there, um, usually you, what you do, you spread out the whole data um, you, um, through across uh, a number of servers, depending on the size of your data set. And then you have leaf servers that, do, that process the query for you, accumulate that. And sometimes you have several levels where you run that query through. And by the way, that was the query we just parsed with our three books. Of course, this, this is quite efficient. And how efficient can be also seen in that white paper I mentioned. And I took a few of the statistics out there for you to look at. Um, for instance, um, there is a, a benchmark using 87 terabytes of data. And um, by using BigQuery, um, you, you efficient, efficiently eliminate uh, like... Uh, 86.5 terabytes of that data that doesn't need to be processed anymore if you, if you use BigQuery as a data processing engine. And here's a comparison of the data sets uh, um, or um, the data retrieval time, the execution time, using different or a number of technologies to retrieve the data. Uh, MapReduce being the first one, then, you, when, then we have uh, um, um, Dremel, which is BigQuery essentially. And uh, the middle one is MapReduce when you use a columnar representation. So you see that's a potential optimization in its own right, um, just to use uh, a columnar representation. And Dremel is, a, is able to eliminate a lot of the data processing that you usually have to do. And this is a similar case. So here, um, 24 billion records, 13 terabytes of data, and you see um, the number of levels um, that, that, you, that you use uh, also defines how fast you basically run your query. All right, and before you start throwing things at me because I run over time, um, this was a quick tour through the algorithm of BigQuery. I hope you, you kind of like, well, get interested enough to have a look at BigQuery and maybe even at the white paper. It's, it's a kind of like an interesting read if, you, if you're in computer science. And in any case, BigQuery as an API should be worth playing around with if you, if you like to analyze big data sets. Um, 
I'm I'm around in the in the break, and today and tomorrow you you can find me on the on premise. Um, also, you can of course find me online um, and and shout me a question that might come later um, to you. And uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. I hope it was a little bit of fun using BigQuery. So I might allow two questions if they are immediate. Ah. He might. Yeah. So only if the question is right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, I saw in the previous demonstration that we um, was using BigQuery to do uh, BigQuery to do joins of data sets, and I was wondering how that's implemented because the way the execution tree stuff works, I can only imagine how it works for um, scanning over a single data source. But obviously, with joins, you've got to scan multiple data sources. And I'm not really, I don't really understand how that combine works. Yeah, that, that's basically where the magic of the Google Data Center happens, how we spread out the data and run it simultaneously. But uh, what I tried to cover here is the essential way how, how the algorithm in itself works. And as you say, it's not that, that complicated. And if you, if you do joins or multiple joins, you basically pre-process the data in the data center where you have uh, larger data sets then. But again, you can have columns where you select items and, and bring it together that way. There was a second one over there, or here. Uh, sorry. Uh, related question, how do you limit, uh, so that could be simple query, could be complex query, as far as I understand, you charge per storage and per uh, size of data set which was downloaded. But I, I can imagine that if you can very complex queries which would consume a lot of processing power, how do you limit or how do you solve these cases? So it wouldn't become bottleneck for you or very cost inefficient. So, oh, oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, the question is, how do you control cost, yes. essentially? Um, there, there are a number of things that you, that you can, uh, can look at. There is a, a, um, a control center where you, where you can define limits and how you, how you actually uh, want to allow, how many transactions you want to allow, how much workload you want to allow. And secondly, you have a, a full set of APIs that you can script against or write code against if you want to control your, your queries, like um, how much how much time is allowed, how much consumption before you get, for, for instance, a warning and you restructure your data. But um, there are, um, I'm, not, I'm not really um, familiar right now with the current pricing on, on BigQuery, but uh, there, I think there, there is quite a number of, of uh, queries that you can do at a relatively low price point before it really becomes uh, hurtful. Okay, one last. One last. I think, yeah. I have a question about the filling out the gaps. So it seems that your records, I mean, you infer the structure from the data you've got. So what if a new record comes in and has a, alters the existing structure? How do you fill, it, fill out the gaps effectively? Because it feels like it could be a massive fun out of updates to your database. Yeah, so, so what you do here is read only operations. So you pump up the whole thing, and uh, then you do analysis uh, against it. Uh, if there would be a live data set, like processing in the back while you're doing queries, then, then I'm with you, then it's probably a little bit complicated to fill out the whole thing. Um, so it, it happens once when you push the data update, and then, then you read, uh, you're all set. All right. Um, I'm here for questions uh, after the session. Um, for those of you uh, who like to, to uh, show up, um, I'm pretty happy to. Oh, yeah. So you, you like to me to give away those T-shirts? <laughs> Anyone here who likes to have a T-shirt? Uh, I tried to get one really far. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was not really far. That was like middle. And that it's like in front row. And <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>